Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the new seminar series on time, temperature, and chemical potential dependence in quantum field theory. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Paul Romashko with us from far away Colorado. And uh, before we start uh, Paul's talk, Paul's inaugural talk, I just want to uh, make uh, a few remarks. So one remark is that the idea for the seminar is, well, to make it very interactive so that we create uh, some sort of a virtual community in which we get together closer to, to, to exchanging our views on, on the topic of common interests, so collective aspects of quantum field theory. Uh, so please do ask questions and please do interrupt Paul. Um, and of course, you can do this by unmuting yourself asking a question and then uh, going back to the mute mode to not to um, uh, lower the quality of, 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 of the talk that way. Um, and secondly, uh, the idea is to have these seminars every month. We have sort of confirmed Paul Chesler as a second speaker uh, in about a month from now. We're going to send a separate announcement about it. Uh, please uh, make suggestions and we'll try to accommodate as many of these suggestions uh, as we can. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'm very happy to start this talk. Uh, so Paul, please tell us about pure CFT thermodynamics and fractional degrees of freedom. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the uh, invitation to sort of give the talk. Um, I'm quite sympathetic with the idea of not having to fly to Berlin to sort of do this in person. Uh, this is uh, certainly uh, a very uh, CO2 friendly uh, as well as time friendly way of, of presenting the work. Uh, so I'm very happy and sort of, uh, uh, sympathetic to the idea. Um, for those of you who don't uh, have had the chance of, of visiting Boulder, this uh, first slide shows you where I'm from. Uh, so sometimes people at conferences show a slide of the conference where they are. Um, I decided to turn it around and instead show a slide from where we are from because people at the conference already know how the place looks like where they are. So maybe. Um, Anyways, so this is sort of a picture of Boulder, um, pretty much as it is now. Um, so it's live. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere here. Uh, so you can see my pointer. No, it's not true. Uh, but uh, this is the University of Colorado, and uh, we are basically located right where the clay, Great Plains go over into the Rocky Mountains. So east from us, it's flat all the way to the Appalachian Mountains. And just west from us, uh, we have the foothills here, with, uh, which are about 3,000 meters. And then further west, it goes up to the continental divide, up to 4,300. That's sort of the, the local geography. Anyways, so basically what um, I want to talk to you about today is something um, that I've been sort of busy myself with uh, this year. Um, has to do with uh, the idea of trying to solve theories that are uh, pure conformal theories, pure CFTs. And uh, I sort of want to talk about also something that I stumbled across in that context, which are these fractional degrees of freedom. Um, and let me sort of remind you also that, that I would sort of welcome uh, any sort of questions. Uh, I don't really have an agenda to sort of go through everything. Um, I, I want to sort of get started and give you some flavor, but there's no need for me to sort of really cover everything in case there's some interest for me to go into uh, one of the topics more deeply. Okay, so without further delay, let me sort of uh, go to the outline of the talk today. Um, I want to start with the motivation of uh, what it is that I'm doing. Um, I want to sort of introduce what are these pure uh, CFTs that I'll talk about. Then I'll talk about how to solve uh, some of these pure CFTs and I'll talk about mostly thermodynamics, so equilibrium properties. Um, I'll touch very briefly about more interesting uh, dynamic things, so the time dependence transport. Um, and then um, I'll sort of talk about uh, one of the uh, other topics in the title, which are these fractional degrees of freedom. And I'll start with uh, sort of an epilogue on what I call the fractional photon. Okay, um, let me start with the motivation. The motivation for me at least was um, to look at one of the uh, well-tested theories in, in physics, which is N equals four super mass. That's a theory that is an SUN gauge theory, non-abelian gauge theory, uh, consists of gauge fields, uh, fermions, and scalars. These are the particle degrees of freedom. You can write on a Lagrangian for the fifth theory. This Lagrangian uh, uh, shows that this theory is supersymmetric, and it has one coupling constant, which is a tooth coupling uh, lambda, which you can think of being equivalent to the gauge coupling G squared 
um, times n the number of the uh, uh, colors in, in the gauge group. And uh, this theory has the property that it's exactly conformal for all values of the coupling constant lambda and all values of the uh, uh, color n, basically. At weak coupling, uh, because we have a Lagrangian, we can uh, solve this theory. Um, for instance, we can put the theory at find a temperature t. Um, we'll break supersymmetry in the process, um, but that, that's perfectly fine. Um, and we can calculate thermodynamic properties such as the entropy density s of the theory at weak coupling. Um, and um, that can be done at any n, but uh, because I want to compare mostly to results at large n, I'll just write down the large n result where you find that the free entropy density S3 is given by some number. Uh, the only thing I want to sort of point out is that it scales like the number of colors squared, n squared. Uh, it scales like the temperature cube because we are in, in four dimensions. And then there, the rest are pure numbers. And uh, uh, maybe sort of for later use, I want to point out that there's this funny thing that is one plus seven, eight. Uh, the one means that um, the one tells you that all the properties to the left of this uh, correspond to the bosonic degrees of freedom. And the 7 8 says that every fermionic degrees of freedom just is worth 7 8 of one bosonic degrees of freedom. Um, so that's why it is a 1 plus 7 8. Um, long story short, you get a result for these three entropy density, which happens to be this um, n squared times pi squared t cubed times two thirds. Okay, so the two thirds is the thing that you should remember to the next slide because I'm sort of, I'm sort of motivated that for it. So at strong coupling, um, we can also uh, handle this theory, uh, which is special. There are not that many theories where we have a Lagrangian that you can um, also treat a strong coupling, um, but uh, that can be done with this uh, gravity dual that is just classical gravity in ADS5. Um, again, there we can put the theory at finer temperature, which we do by putting a black brain into the ADS5 geometry and calculating the entropy through calculating the horizon area of the black brain. By doing that at strong uh, at large n, we find that now the entropy density in the strong coupling regime um, is also given by pure numbers times t cubed, and the pure number is now uh, n squared pi squared over two. If I go back, the free energy, uh, the free sort of theory result was the same number two thirds, but now we have one half. One half is exactly three quarters of two thirds. So we find that in the strong coupling limit at infinite coupling the entropy density is exactly equal to the free energy density, sorry, free entropy density times three quarters. So it's exactly three quarters. This is not an approximation. Um, and that factor has sort of become somewhat of a celebrity in the string theory community. Originally, we thought it's an error. Um, people thought they should, should get the same number as, as, as in the free uh, theory limit. Eventually, it was figured out that no, it's not an error. It's actually really three quarters. And people have sort of um, tried to sort of understand that um, where these three quarters really come from. Why these three quarters, I think we really don't know. Uh, and I, I won't really be able to give you an answer why these three quarters. I'll add some speculations for why that is. Let me sort of continue by saying that, of course, you can do um, corrections around both the free results and a strong ADS a CFT uh, result at an infinite coupling. Um, so for instance, you get a plot like this where the entropy density divided by the free entropy density, which is here denoted as S naught, uh, is plotted as a function of the coupling. So at weak coupling, uh, one finds that the result uh, gets corrected by order, um, by order lambda to one is the first uh, version. Uh, then the next one is lambda three halves. And, um, at, at very strong coupling down here, we have three quarters, 0 0.75, and there are corrections that sort of go like uh, lambda to the minus three halves around that. And people have sort of tried to sort of put Pade fits in between, assuming that um, the function S over S naught is uh, monotonic in lambda. So basically, um, N equals four super young meals really sort of provided the motivation for, for this program that um, I want to talk tell you about. In particular, it would be really nice to solve quantum P theories exactly, not just for very weak coupling and very strong coupling, but for all values of the coupling. Ideally, of course, at any end, but 
sort of to set the goals reasonable, uh, it would be nice to just do so at the large end limit. Okay, so could it be possible that we have tools to solve large end fee theories uh, for all values of the coupling? And what do we learn if we do that? The second thing to understand that would be uh, nice to have is why these funny fractions, uh, such as three quarters in n equals four silver emails, actually appear, okay? rather than sort of other uh, transcendental numbers or rational numbers or whatever. I want to sort of continue this motivation by telling you a little bit why you might or might not be interested in this uh, program. And this is a, a very sort of personal history account. Um, so let, let, just, just to give you sort of all the information available uh, where, where this can lead or, or has led for me in this particular case. Um, why you should be interested? Well, it's, it's a fruitful field. Um, fruitful in the sense that I've managed to write eight papers about this in this year alone. Two of them in PL, they are, one is published, the other one is, is accepted. Um, one of them has been uh, taken as an editor's suggestion. So you can sort of see this one uh, down, this clip down here from the title. Uh, this is the work that I'll be talking about mostly. Um, this result has uh, had led to interesting consequences. So for instance, um, there was an article that was picked up by Physics Org, which says physicists finds loose thread in string theory puzzle. Um, which sort of covered some article that our local uh, Boulder office had written, which sort of uh, harks upon this uh, idea that uh, one can sort of uh, find uh, exact results in quantum field theories that give these funny fractions. And uh, uh, the other thing that has come out of it is that uh, apparently there is a Portuguese version of uh, Wikipedia. And if you know Portuguese, there's, there's a paragraph that says, Paul Romachke, M 2019, Inventu um Conjectu Alternativo, and so on and so forth, um, that says that basically there is a sort of fit theory sort of result that, that uh, is, is uh, trying to sort of uh, explain this three quarters dilemma, dilemma de tres quartos. Um, and uh, by uh, me talking or trying to sort of pronounce this, you can, you can tell that actually I didn't write this, okay? There was somebody else who wrote this. It was not me because I don't actually speak Portuguese. I can't even read it. Um, so, okay, so there, there is some, there is some uh, interest, I would say, in the community. Um, however, there are sort of other things that you should consider. So um, of these eight papers that uh, I've written, here's some uh, archive, sorry, uh, Spires clip. Um, so they seem to be uh, gathering citations, not very many, but some of them. Um, so let's click at one of these citation records and look inside, okay? So if we click at these five citations for uh, record number seven, which is this paper I talked about before, you find that uh, actually all five of those are by me. <laughs> so all of them are self cites, and the same is true for all the other eight papers that I've written on the subject, okay? <laughs> So basically what this means is that uh, uh, while uh, there, there is some apparent interest, uh, the interest is not such that people are actually actively working on this, at least in the sense of, of citing any of the papers that I've written on this in this year. Okay. So to summarize, um, I, I have had great fun sort of doing that, that kind of exercise and program. So um, that's maybe one reason why uh, people should be interested in, in, in this. Um, it's really easy to write fast papers, right? I mean, so some of these I've written, I, I've conceived the paper on a Monday and the paper was out on a Friday. Um, so it, it's, it's really fast to sort of write papers, uh, publish them in PRL is also not an uh, issue. You get friendly reference boards, the best I've ever gotten, uh, even for PRL. Um, it's easy to get press coverage, apparently. Um, the uh, thing, however, is, is it's a subfield that doesn't really exist. Um, so don't expect to get citations, okay? Uh, so it's sort of more of a, a a hobby if you wanted. Anyways, um, so I, I wanted you to be aware of, of, of these, uh, let's say, mm, sociologically boundary conditions before we embark on the actual journey into, into the science, okay? Which is what I want to sort of do now. So I want to talk about pure CFTs. Um, what are pure CFTs? So first of all, let me uh, remind you that CFTs or conformal field theories are quantum field theories that respect conformal symmetry. As such, uh, some of the conditions for a conformal field theory are such that the theory has vanishing beta function, so the derivative of the coupling with respect to uh, some uh, uh, energy scale. Uh, there are no zero temperature mass scales, um, otherwise there would be a scale and that breaks this conformal symmetry. And uh, sort of somewhat synonymously to that, 
uh, that means that the trace of the energy momentum tensor uh, vanishes. Normally, um, you get a conformal field theory by taking a parent quantum field theory, Q of D, by tuning parameters. So for instance, you have to tune to zero mass and you have to tune your, your uh, couplings such that at one particular critical coupling, lambda critical, um, you do have uh, the property difference since the beta function vanishes. Pure CFDs are quantum field theories which respect these conformal symmetry, not just at one particular value of the coupling, but for all values of the coupling. Okay? Um, some people call this a, a line of fixed points, uh, but it's just a statement that um, no matter which coupling lambda you choose, you always have a conformal field theory. Um, so CFTs are um, special quantum field theories, so they are not that common. Um, and pure CFTs are a subset of the CFTs, so they are actually quite rare. One of the well-known examples for a pure CFT is, of course, N equals four superemials, which has the property that it is a conformal field theory for every single value of the coupling. Okay, the beta function vanishes exactly for all values of the tooth coupling for all n. The question is, are there any other uh, pure CFTs? And uh, one of the- Yeah, I have uh, a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, when you change this coupling, is, is it the same CFT or the CFT remains the same as you change this critical coupling? Um, so it is the same Lagrangian. And uh, the, you can take any coupling value, and it's a CFT for all of them. Is that it's the same a CFT? But it's not necessarily the same CFT. I mean, the CFT itself can you can have a different CFT along this uh, critical line, or well, this well, let me so, let, let me let me give you an example, and and then you tell me whether it's the same CFT or it's a different CFT, because I, I'm not okay. sure if I can actually answer the question. I mean, in a, in a CFT literature, people think about uh, the set of all three-point functions and set, set of all scaling dimensions, and even at n equal to four superannuals, there are operators whose uh, scaling dimension changes as a function of the coupling constant, right? Um, so so I, I, would, I would say that these are different CFTs. Okay. The same so like that, and different CFTs. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Sorry for the intrusion. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I think that that's precisely the point of the interactive nature of these talks, right? So, um, so here's basically one of these examples of this pure CFT that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is a well-known model. It's the ON vector model. Um, the only sort of maybe uncommon feature is that the interaction is sextic, okay? So it has a term that, um, so written down the Lagrangian, it has a term that uh, has a, uh, the uh, feet uh, phi squared, and then the whole thing cubed. So we have uh, six sort of insertions of the um, of the uh, field operator, basically. Um, this um, field theory can be sort of uh, put at finite temperature via the usual construction of an imaginary time, um, introducing an imaginary time, and as such, then the uh, space-time structure of that is just a thermal cylinder. So it's S one for the thermal uh, um, direction, the thermal circle times R2, because um, this theory I want to study in, in the two space dimensions. So such the metric is basically three-dimensional Euclidean. Um, yeah, and uh, this is the Lagrangian, so there's nothing uh, particularly interesting going on with the uh, kinetic theorem. Uh, I've written down a mass term, um, but eventually I will sort of tune the mass away so that I'm basically considering this critical theory, and uh, the phi is just an n-component uh, scalar vector. So I claim that this theory is a pure CFD and uh, um, yeah, so let's sort of see why, why I make this claim. Okay. So um, the nice thing about this theory is that the partition function Z for the theory can actually be calculated exactly for all lambdas um, in the large n limit. The beta function for lambdas two is zero for all lambdas and um, if you want, so that's a special thing about the three dimensions where um, there are no logarithmic uh, divergences. So this uh, coupling lambda two, which is classically marginal, remains marginal um, even if you turn on um, quantum interaction. 
the energy momentum tensor for this theory is also traceless for all values of lambda. And uh, the calculation is fairly straightforward. It only uses uh, standard uh, quantum field theory tools, okay? So I will not really sort of go through all of the details. Um, I will give you a bird's eye view of how this is done. Uh, you can either sort of read the uh, corresponding paper or I also have backup slides um, that I'm happy to sort of go through in case you have uh, detailed questions. So what I, I plan to do is I wanna give you one slide with the bird's eye view of how to do this uh, if you want to for the experts. Um, for those of you who have not done that in before basically, this uh, slide will not make a lot of sense. Um, um, but uh, I, I want to sort of get to the results and discuss the physics rather than walking you through uh, how to sort of get to the techniques. But the techniques sort of are there. They're not that hard to understand. Sorry, uh, Paul, I have a question. Um, do you mean to set the mass term to zero when you say this is a CFT? That's correct. I set the mass term to zero. And um, in, in three dimensions, um, this is also special. Um, I mean, there is a linear divergence, um, but in, in MS bar scheme, uh, regularization scheme, that linear divergence just goes away. And basically what that means is that you can set the bare mass to zero. And then in MS bar, um, there are no anomalous dimensions. So that the mass, the bare mass, or the, the renormalized mass stays zero, basically. Okay, and when you say it's a CFT and the beta function is zero for lambda two, do you mean in perturbation theory or non perturbative No, theory? exactly. Non-perturbatively. Exactly. Yes, non-perturbatively for all lambdas from zero to infinity. Okay. Yes. So um, here's the bird's eye view for experts. Um, so what we want to do is we want to solve the theory by calculating the partition function exactly, not in perturbation theory. The way how to do this is you sort of use auxiliary fields, sigma and uh, zeta. Um, this is basically a hubbard stratontovich transformation. And the way that I sort of uh, want to write this is I want to sort of insert unity as a path integral over delta function where this uh, auxiliary field sigma is set to the value of phi squared. And then I want to rewrite the delta function as the exponential using a second auxiliary field zeta such that you get e to the i zeta times uh, the thing that should become the delta function. The important thing is that um, at large n, it turns out that only the zero modes of these auxiliary fields, sigma and uh, zeta contribute. Uh, their fluctuations uh, give one over n uh, corrections, but in the leading large n limit, you only need the zero modes, nothing else contributes. The um, integration then over the field um, is now completely quadratic because our interaction term, um, we can rewrite the uh, phi six term as just a sigma cubed, and then the phi square term, uh, the, the only sort of phi uh, dependence now is, sort of, is coupled to this uh, uh, auxiliary field uh, sigma. So basically we just have a quadratic Lagrangian in, in phi, which we can just integrate out. Uh, these are just massive uh, scalar fields um, without any interactions. So all of the interaction, if you want to, so then goes into this uh, mass term. Uh, so this is not the bare mass term, this is some sort of um, dynamically generated mass, okay? At, uh, large n, then the integral over the zero modes, which is left, um, we can again get exactly by uh, finding the settle points of the uh, remaining sort of uh, exponential. And uh, the sort of corrections then would again give only one of n corrections. So at leading order, we can um, calculate the partition function exactly using the settle point of uh, this action. So essentially, uh, all the non-trivial result uh, then sort of comes from the settle point condition, which essentially becomes a gap, so-called gap equation for the scalar mass, okay? So that's really what happened. So the results of this exercise is that we have uh, basically a, a, a field theory result where the only non-trivial um, component is this uh, thermal mass um, psi. And this uh, thermal mask psi basically fulfills the gap equation, which I've written down here. Um, and what you sort of notice is that this depends on the coupling parameter lambda two. Um, this uh, gap equation is not a weak coupling concept, okay? So it's an exact solution um, of the partition function. And even though usually um, thermal masses crop up in perturbation theory, this equation is well-defined and exact for all values of lambda. In particular, you can sort of expand for small lambda, and of course you get back perturbation theory. If uh, you also take the other, you can also take the other limit, in particular the limit 
uh, lambda goes to infinity, which is the strong coupling limit. And then something pretty cute happens. Um, the left-hand side here uh, goes away completely when we send lambda to infinity. And uh, we are solving the equation by sort of saying that the right-hand side itself should have a zero. And the solution for that is um, that you get that this uh, value for this um, thermal mass becomes twice the logarithm of the golden ratio, okay? This is one plus square root of two, uh, five over two. So that's just the value that you get for the thermal mass in the infinite coupling limit. I want to pause here briefly to see whether there are questions on this. Yes, I have a question. Uh, so this argument you gave based on this trick, this uh, introducing these auxiliary fields, will that work in other dimensions or, or why not? The trick itself works in other dimensions. The key about three dimensions really is renormalizability. So in, in even dimensions, you will generally get uh, anomalous dimensions. So we have to renormalize the theory in a non-trivial way. Uh -huh. um, in the large end limit, you can still sort of get some mileage out of this. Um, but, um, right, so, so for instance, so the, the short answer is yes, it works in all dimensions. And indeed, I have sort of used that technique also in four dimensions. Um, the thing, however, is that the theory in four dimensions, for instance, is trivial. Um, so you have a lambda pole. So, so that so sense divergences would then appear in the path integral or the auxiliary fields that you're left with? So, Correct. Okay. Yes. Well, it, it appears in the integral over the, 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 the fields phi. That's very how the divergences appear. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's perfectly well defined, but um, generally, uh, if you do that in dimensions where uh, you have to renormalize, where there are non vanishing anomalous dimensions, what happens is that you cannot take a well defined infinite coupling limit. But in three dimensions, everything is perfectly fine. That's special about three dimensions. Actually, five is also fine, but odd dimensions generally. Okay. And uh, sorry, one more thing. So this result is exact uh, at large n, is that correct? That's correct. It's the okay. leading large n result. There are one over n corrections. Okay. Further questions? Okay. So um, that is just, was just a condition of this uh, oh, oh, saddle sorry. point. Yes. Uh, one more question. D did you explore uh, one over n corrections to, to the story? No, I have not. Um, well, I, well, we have thought about one over n corrections in a different context. Um, I have thought about one over corrections in uh, two dimensions. Um, and yes, you can get some mileage out of that by sort of calculating the complete uh, one over n and one over n squared terms, but the resulting um, technique is somewhat more complicated. It's not sufficient to just have a mass term. You actually need to read some inf infinite uh, classes of, of Feynman diagrams with different topologies. Um, so, so yes, you can do something. It, it's sort of, it's sort of a, a, a HDL resummation on steroids, um, which you can do, um, but it it's typically means you have to do it numerically. Um, whereas pretty much everything I'll do today is essentially completely analytic. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, the partition function uh, then basically is just given as the evaluation of that um, uh, sort of exponential on the of the saddle points, and uh, we can sort of generate um, thermodynamic properties such as the pressure and the entropy density by just um, using usual thermodynamic relations of the partition function. Okay, so the pressure, for instance, is just the uh, derivative of the um, partition, log of the partition function by V, the volume, and the entropy density is just the derivative of the pressure with respect to T, the temperature. Um, so what you find is that these results then depend on the coupling only implicitly through this thermal mass parameter psi, which itself is a solution to this gap equation. So just to sort of give you a, a concrete example, I have written down the entropy density S um, for this uh, pure CFT here. So that's the exact result. It is written down in terms of poly logarithms and usual logarithms. And all of these just depend on uh, Xi. So basically all the coupling dependence is in this uh, value of Xi. And uh, the prefactor is just a sort of essentially given by dimensional reasons. 
you can make a plot of this entropy density for all values of the coupling. Okay, so again, this is exact in the large n limit. Um, it's a little bit maybe unconventional to plot it this way. What I've done is I've plotted the entropy density divided by the free theory value. That's the value at zero coupling. And for your convenience, I've sort of written it down here. It's the value you get if you go back this result here and you set xi zero. Okay, that's the value you get because that's the free theory result. Um, and I've plotted it not as a function of the coupling as is usual, but I've plotted it as one over one plus the square root of the coupling. And I've done that because then I can compactify the whole interval of the coupling zero to infinity in this region zero to one. Okay, so that's the idea. So vanishing coupling, the free theory now is on the right hand upper side, uh, right hand side here at lambda, uh, or at, at this parameter being one. And infinite coupling is all the way to the left, um, where we are down here. And you see it's a monotonic function. It sort of decreases monotonic, the entropy decreases monotonically with lambda. And uh, the other thing that you find is that there is this funny value um, that seems to be curving up. It sort of looks like 0 0.8, okay? So this is a curious value. You can get, you can inspect this value by taking the formula I gave you before and uh, evaluating it in the infinite coupling limit. I told you that in the infinite coupling limit, the solution for the gap equation psi is twice the logarithm of the golden ratio. So you plug this into the formula uh, over here, and you use some identities of these polar logarithms to show that um, what you get out for the entropy density is some result here that is uh, 12 zeta of three over 10 pi times nt squared. And you find that this is exactly four fifth times the free entropy density. Okay. So again, it's exactly four fifth. It's not just order four fifth or almost four fifth. You can show it's exactly four fifth. Okay. And uh, after I have sort of realized this, um, I found that okay, I, I, I'm not the first one to get this. Um, people have actually realized this over 20 years ago. So there's a paper in particular by Subia Sashtev in '93. They sort of go through um, essentially the, the argument for the ON model, and he also finds this four fifth term. And people have picked it up over the years, um, but uh, most of these developments were pre ADS CFT. Okay, so at least I, I didn't know about this before before I went into this calculation. Good, fine. Uh, are there any questions up to this point? Not seeing any, I will uh, move on. So, um, fine. So we find that for this particular feed theory, the on n model with sextic interactions, you find that um, the ratio, strong weak, strong weak ratio, so the entropy density, the infinite coupling, divided by the entropy density in the free theory is exactly four fifth. One thing you might be worried about is, okay, maybe this is just a fluke, okay? I mean. Who knows, right? I mean, if you have a very special theory with very special interaction, okay, it could be, could be a coincidence that this is four fifth, but well, maybe there's nothing deep about it. One way to sort of see whether that's uh, special is if um, we change the interaction term, okay? So we could um, change the interaction term from sextic interaction to, for instance, quartic interaction. So have a Lagrangian where I've sort of put a usual 5-4 uh, term in the interaction potential. And uh, we can do even more crazy stuff, okay? We can change the interaction such that instead of having a quartic interactions, we have any potential phi squared of n times n with the only condition that it has a minimum, a single minimum at um, basically the value where this is zero. The reason for single minimum is that uh, I want to forbid uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking and mass generation, okay? So if, if you make a potential that spontaneously break the symmetry and generate the mass, we will not have a CFT and then the result for the entropy density would be zero because that's basically what's happening. But let's sort of explore what happens if we have this arbitrary potential. In fact, you can show that for all of these uh, classes of potential and infinite class of interaction potentials, you always get these results. You always get that in the infinite coupling limit, the uh, thermal mass is twice the logarithm of the golden ratio, and this strong weak ratio of the entropy density is always four fifths. This result is universal in the strong coupling limit at large n for pretty much a lot for a large class of interaction potential. 
why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why this is, um, but um, you can sort of do the math and it's sort of pretty clear that, that this is universal. Um, and that's really where, where this, this four fifth ratio is really the result that all of these um, bosonic interacting theories are driven to. So you got one question? Yes. So maybe I got confused, but uh, in your first example, you had a phi, a, a sextic phi to the six yes. interaction because that was already classically marginal. Yes. So, but now you're saying you have a phi to the fourth interaction still in three dimensions? Yes. But that's not uh, marginal anymore. That's correct. This one is, is relevant. And uh, the dimensionless combination is then lambda over some energy scale. At finite temperature, this would be lambda over the temperature. And the infinite coupling limit then is lambda to infinity or temperature to zero. Ah, so this is no longer, okay. It's this not, is no but, longer what I could call a pure CFD. It's just a CFD. At well, how, how is this a CFD? Wait, wait, how is this a CFD if you have a dimension full coupling? Yes, um, so it's a CFT because it turns out that um, in the limits lambda to infinity or temperature to zero, um, this coupling uh, vanishes from the description and what you get is so-called an infrared conformal theory. Ah, so now you're thinking of flow into now, it. Now it's a usual CFT and you're sitting at the fixed point. Okay, so yeah. when you say actually lambda going to infinity or to zero, what you actually mean is going to higher or lower energy scales. In this case, yes, if it's not a pure CFT, you're absolutely right. That's what I mean. Yeah. So then it's the usual UV IR story where you're comparing the feed theory in the UV where the coupling is zero, it's a free uh, feed theory, to um, the coupling where you have an emergent CFT in the infrared, um, and you're comparing the ratio of these two terms. And you find that it gives exactly the same as for the pure CFT. This four fifth is, is the same. And you can do it with any relevant coupling. It doesn't have to be phi four. You can yeah, make up. You just want something that flows the fixed point in the infrared. Correct. Yes. Um, so I, I wanted to sort of uh, also point out that these uh, O-N model as strong coupling at large N um, are potentially interesting from a gravity point of view because they have been conjectured to have a gravity dual, which is higher spin gravity. Um, and there are, oops, any positive, you're supposed to be uh, saying positive checks on this conjecture. Um, unlike the case of N equals four super emails, for the ON model, we can actually solve the theory uh, for pretty much any value of the coupling. Okay, so, um, so I, I, I said that for, uh, if I put a, a phi four interaction term there, uh, the theory is no longer pure CFT, but the same techniques of solving still sort of go through. Um, so you basically still get an exact result for all values of the uh, coupling, um, which you can evaluate. Uh, so that means that we have full control over the free theory in the lodging limit. And indeed, to me, it seems like this is probably the perfect candidate for trying to prove the actual conjecture. Maybe I should stop once more before I go on and see whether there's some further questions. Okay. So um, actually, uh, yes. there's, a, there's a reflex required to hit the unmute button. Uh, so, so my question uh, is, uh, uh, what is the difference in methodology between uh, what you outlined in your talk and these earlier works that uh, you referred to, in particular the papers by uh, Subir Sajda uh, from the uh, 90s? Right, exactly. So Supia basically sort of says, oh, this ON model has an interacting IR fixed point. Let me just look at what happens at the fixed point. Uh -huh. So it's not so trying to solve the theory at all couplings. It's just looking at the properties at the fixed point. Okay. The uh, other work, the uh, work by um, Hogan, Drummond, and Rapan, they were trying to do super daisy resummations in HDL. And they figured out that that um, basically uh, is the exact sort of result in the large and limit of the uh, sort of bosonic theories. So okay. they sort of were coming from the perturbative free summation game and they were interested in field theories at finite n, but they remarked that, okay, um, if we do super daisy free summations, that gives us the exact uh, large and limit of the theory for all couplings. And, and, so and just they had different, different techniques at getting at the same point. 
And, and, and just to come back to the discussion that, that, that David raised like uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, so using your method, do you have access to the full RT flow or just fixed points? Uh, if the theory is, uh, I mean, if the UV fixed point is relevantly uh, disturbed. Right, so from, from my point of view, the, the RG nature of these things is, is extremely simple in three dimensions. So if uh, you are, well, if, if, if you have a pure CFD, it's, it's just a pure CFD so that the, the, um, the beta function is always zero. But um, if, we have, if we turn on a relevant uh, interaction, such as the 5-4 term, then the beta function is just given by the trivial running of the dimension of the coupling. Okay, so in three dimensions, um, if you turn on the phi four interactions, phi has dimension one half. So the phi four is dimension two. So the coupling that's in front of the phi four is dimension one. And that means that the uh, beta function is such that, um, well, the derivative of lambda over mu is just minus lambda over mu squared, okay? okay. So th that's all to it. And the fixed point then is, if you want to add mu is zero or lambda is infinity. There are no other non-trivial fixed points. So yes, you have exact to the exact. You have access to the exact uh, uh, sort of renormalization uh, flow, but it's really trivial. And uh, like last question, not, not to stop you from from going further. Uh, so over here, you're pre you're presenting results for the thermodynamics. Uh, is there some limitation to studying uh, correlation functions? No. And uh, if you Allow me to go on for another five minutes or so. I will show you how those look like. And uh, when it comes to real-time dependence, uh, can you also do this? Yeah, you can. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. Yes. Thanks. Further questions? OK. Um, so just sort of close the loop, um, there are other pure CFDs in three dimensions that you can solve. Uh, another example is this uh, west sumina model, which is a supersymmetric field theory. Uh, here's the uh, action written down with the superfield phi. Um, basically, uh, you, can, you can sort of uh, use exactly the same technique as before to solve this theory exactly. And then you have a theory that has the equal number of bosons and fermions. Um, you find that again, uh, there is the sort of non-trivial piece is a, a thermal mass for, both, for the bosons and the fermions. Um, the interesting thing is that the uh, boson mass happens to be the, the exact same one as for the purely bosonic theory, uh, whereas the fermions at the strong coupling limit, uh, the fermion mass goes to zero. And um, you can also make uh, non supersymmetric versions that involve fermions by just uh, changing the coupling of the um, fermions to the bosons away from the uh, supersymmetric version. So uh, this is just to say that, that other pure CFTs exist. I have a plot here for the west model, which is the supersymmetric model. Um, MB is the boson mass, the same as what, what Xi was before. And then there's a, a fermion mass, MF, which is the fermionic equivalent. And I plot them again as the function of this uh, coupling. So to the right uh, side here, we have the free theory. To the left, we have infinite coupling. And what you can see is that the boson mass sort of starts at zero and goes again to this value 0 0.96, which is just the uh, twice the logarithm of the golden ratio. Whereas the fermion mass first increases, reaches a maximum, then goes back to zero at the infinite coupling. The entropy density for this uh, Westomina model sort of has this shape here. Um, it starts out at a free theory value uh, at one here normalized, and then it sort of decreases monotonically and reaches, again, a certain value. This value here, again, is an is a exact fraction. It happens to be 31 over 35, for reasons that I can explain. And uh, again, it's monotonically decreasing with lambda. You can again show that um, for uh, equal numbers of bosons and fermions, there is strong coupling universality. So you can show that for pretty much any for a large class of interaction potentials, in the strong coupling limit, you always get these results that the boson mass is twice the logarithm of the golden ratio, and that the ratio of the entropy density at strong coupling versus the entropy density weak coupling is always this 31 over 35. And just to sort of demystify that funny uh, fraction, the 31 uh, over 35 comes about by saying that um, in three dimensions, 
the fermions contribute not seven eight but only three quarters of one bosonic degrees of freedom. So we have one for the boson bosons, three quarters for the fermions. And then strong coupling, uh, the bosons get reduced to four fifth because their mass is non-zero, but the fermions have zero mass, so their contribution is the same as in free uh, in the free theory. And then you sort of have four fifth plus three quarters divided by block one plus three quarters, and that gives the 31, 435. So this is where it comes from. You can also consider unequal numbers of bosons and fermions. So any combinations of bosons with any combinations of fermions um, with pretty much any combination of uh, uh, interaction terms, as long as they are interacting, and you find that there's a bound of S over S3, which is bounded by the purely bosonic uh, result of four, uh, four quarters. No, four fifths, sorry, yes. So this is just to show that, that okay, this, this, uh, Ratio of four fifths really sort of is a quantity that's pretty universal for three dimensional uh, quantum wave theories um, that have uh, bosons and fermions. Questions on that? Yeah, one, one question. Is there anything that can be said about, you know, say, for example, maximally supersymmetric super young meals in three dimensions, which would be, you know, has this infrared fixed point, which is an M2 brain and so on? So, so the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I, I've, I've tried to sort of see whether I can make some headway in trying to understand these um, transignment theories in three dimensions, which you can also sort of solve exactly. Um, I think there's a relation. Um, I, I, I don't really know how explicit the relation can be made. So really all, all I have said here is just for the fifth theory where I can actually calculate um, which are uh, scalars and, and, and fermions. So for these, uh, these results are firm. I don't know what happens if you add gauge fields to this construction, but I have a different theory which gauge fields that I want to get to if I manage to get to. Okay, um, transport. So, um, for n equals first two PMLs, um, we can, uh, one interesting calculate to quantity, one interesting quantity to calculate is the uh, correlator of the energy momentum tensor. For instance, TXY, TXY uh, correlator uh, gives us the retarded green, spun, green function for this uh, particular channel. And uh, as the experts well know, um, this sort of results in a plot where if we take the uh, frequency omega in the complex plane, we find that these Green's functions has poles for the black brain. Um, these are uh, just the uh, quasi normal modes of the corresponding black hole in ADS5. And we can make a plot of these poles in the uh, complex uh, frequency plane here, a real part on the horizontal axis, uh, imaginary part uh, on the vertical axis, and you get these uh, Christmas tree structure uh, that comes out of the black brain. It turns out that um, you can do exactly the same thing for the uh, ON model in large n. You can calculate this two-point function. Um, and again, I will not bore you with the details. What you find is that the uh, uh, two-point function sort of has this structure here. Um, so it's still written in terms of a sum, but the sum is just over the thermal frequencies uh, n. So n here basically runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if you stare at this and you want to know what is the structure uh, in terms of omega, which is the frequency that we want to sort of evaluate this here, uh, you find that um, the uh, structure is such that this um, has uh, branch cuts located at uh, plus and minus uh, a multiple of this uh, thermal mask psi here. Okay. You can stare at this and you sort of find, okay, um, it looks like there's, there's also single poles here, but that's not true because at the point where the denominator here would have a zero, also your logarithm here has a zero. So these are not actual um, poles. These are analytic, okay, they, they are not, singular structures of the, of the uh, grids function. And uh, again, because of strong coupling universality, you can find that also this result is universal at strong coupling, meaning that for different interactions, you will always get the structure of this grids function. The point being that um, unlike the case of n equals four super MS, we have single poles, here we just have a branch cut or two branch cuts okay? at strong coupling. I know this was kind of short, but yeah. So this 
sounds uh, very non-holographic, right? Yes, it's very non-holographic, but it's at infinite coupling. Yes. Yes, but at infinite coupling is where you would expect some holographic description to occur. Correct. But presumably, the reason is that it's a Basiliev theory instead of a. Yes. So, theory. so you you can you can you can make your interpretation. I mean, when I sort of started this calculation, I I hoped that I would get some sort of quasi-normal modes out of this and maybe understand how the putative transition for n equals four super emails from poles to branch cuts um, sort of might be sort of explained or understood. It turns out that for this theory, um, all you get is branch cuts and they are there for any value of the coupling. The structure doesn't change. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm, I'm very slow in getting going. So let me try to talk a little bit about my last topic here which are these fractional degrees to freedom. Um, okay, so numerology, okay. Um, we have these very strong coupling results for the ratio of the entropy density at strong coupling and the entropy density at weak coupling. In four dimensional N equals source would be males, we find S of S3 is three quarters. In the purely bosonic ON model in 3D, we find four fifths. In the Vestomino model, we find 31 over 35. Um, the first thing you might ask is why are these all simple fractions? Okay, I mean they could be square root of two or or one of a pi or, or or any other sort of rational number that we can't explain, but they're just simple fractions. Okay. Let me sort of try to elucidate that by giving you yet another sort of take on a theory that can be exalted exactly, um, which has a photon. Okay. The theory that I can solve exactly at large n is QED in three dimensions with many copies of the electron. So it's the usual QED Lagrangian, F mu U, F mu U, plus a Dirac interaction term. And if you sort of send the number of electrons to infinity, um, then the theory is even simpler than the OM model I talked about before, because there's actually no nested resummation. It's just the one loop term. Okay, so it's just the thing you would write down if you did a one loop quantum field theory correction to your free theory. But it's exact at all couplings in the large n limit. This theory has been sort of uh, studied a long time ago, maybe starting with uh, Rob Pizarski, um, and it was figured out that at finite temperature, uh, this can be a sort of used to solve the 4D theory at around 2003. But um, in four dimensions, the theory has a lambda pole. Okay, so from that point of view, you can calculate exact results, but theories in some sense ill-defined, especially at strong coupling. So the, the, the new thing, if you want to, is that in three dimensions, um, the same story holds that I said before, the theory is uh, perfectly well-defined. It's actually asymptotic um, for all values of the coupling. So you can take the strong coupling value, the strong coupling limit in three dimensions. Okay, the partition function again can be calculated for all value of the effective coupling. And now because we have three dimensions, the dimensions of the uh, electron charge squared here is dimension one. So the dimensionless combination that is relevant is um, E squared over T, the temperature. Okay, so this is sort of the same as for the five four theory of the bosonic theory. In three dimensions at zero temperature, the photon only has one physical degree of freedom. The way that in field theory this usually comes about is that we have two physical degrees of freedom plus minus one ghost. Okay, so the ghost subtracts exactly one degree of freedom and then we're left with the one physical degree of freedom. At finite temperature, there's a thermal mass. So really you have these two branches that both can have different thermal masses minus the ghost. So you get back to your one physical degree of freedom issue. You can calculate the uh, free energy density exactly uh, in the large end limit. Um, you find that the free energy is given as a thermal integral where you now have um, the uh, sort of uh, trace of the uh, kinetic operator plus this photon uh, polarization tensor here, which you have to calculate. Um, so this pi AB are the polarization tensors for the branch A and B, which are the two branches in three dimensions for the photon that you can have. I'm, I'm speeding up as I go. So maybe I should stop here again to see whether there's some questions.
Uh, is there a lesson from this expression apart from the fact that you can write it down in a relatively simple form? Yes, there's a lesson from this expression, um, which might come out two slides later. So the, the main thing is that, okay, if, okay, so for the free theory, this polarization tensor is zero. And then each photon basically contributes uh, a thermal sum of log k squared. Okay, so that's the Dr. Free theory that you should maybe sort of remember. And then we'll talk about the theory at infinite coupling. But I mean, for the point being, um, the point is that these uh, things at any, uh, can be, these uh, polarization tensors can be calculated any value of the coupling. So basically you can plot the uh, free energy or the pressure or any other thermodynamic quantity for any value of the coupling. Um, and this is a plot how this looks like. Um, again, sort of in this funny compactification where the free theory is to the right, the uh, infinite interaction is to the left. And what you find is that uh, the pressure now uh, decreases, but at some point it turns around, it becomes non-monotonic, it goes up, and then, uh, yeah, in this thing, it, it, it becomes numerically tricky to sort of say what happens. Um, you can understand why this is non-monotonic by realizing that this is not a pure CFT, okay? So there's nothing, that, meaning that at any value of the coupling in the middle, the theory is not a CFT. So since it's not a CFT, there is no reason to believe that the um, uh, thermodynamic properties should be monotonic in, in coupling, basically. Um, so let me sort of come to, to my last point here is that um, we can, uh, uh, as I said, we can sort of uh, solve this uh, free energy here by plugging in values for this polarization tensor. In the free theory limit, um, pi is just zero. So um, this turns out to give an entropy density in the free theory limit, which is just the usual uh, log um, that, that you find. Um, so in three dimensions, this gives these um, three zeta t squared over two pi. We can also do the uh, thing at infinite coupling. Um, the value for these um, polarization tensors uh, turns out to be uh, just a vacuum. So if you want to send the coupling to infinity, we can take the temperature to zero. So really all we have to do is look up the zero temperature value for the position tensor. And the main thing uh, that I wanna sort of point your attention at is that it's just the square root of the momentum squared, for momentum squared. And I apologize that the notation is different here. So we have a K squared here and a P here, but um, in your mind, change the P to a K and plug it over here. And then this prefactor here, you send to infinity. So that means that at large coupling, this usual kinetic term k squared will actually be subdominant to whatever it is in the in the pi. So then instead of having the log of k squared, you get the log of square root of k squared. And that means that each photon contribution, each branch A and B, doesn't contribute the free entropy density, but only one half of that because of the log of the square root. So it's exactly one half, and we understand why. questions up to this point. I'm almost done. I have, I think, two more slides or so. Okay, why don't I finish up and then we can see whether there are more questions. So for QED in three dimensions, the reason that you get the one half is that the photon contribution in the partition function is split in half, okay? So this is something that is curious, okay? So the dispersion relation of the photon at infinite coupling is still quadratic. So this is not a thermal mass or any other mass for the photon. The photon is still massless. Really what happens is that um, the photon of strong coupling is just kind of different than the photon of, in the free theory um, in the sense that the kinetic term is not the kinetic term in the free theory, but it sort of gets a square root, okay? So it's like taking the square root out of the kinetic term in the photon. Taking the square root of a kinetic term is not something that is that odd, okay? So maybe this sounds familiar, okay? Taking the square root of a kinetic term of a boson, um, I can think of people who have sort of done things like that in the past. Um, and basically where I wanna get at is that really at infinite coupling, the photon sort of is, is a different kind of particle, okay? It's, it's not uh, the, the usual boson that we think it is, it's some other particle that contributes half the degrees of freedom that 
the boson does. So basically, I want to entertain the idea that at infinite coupling, we get what I call fractional degrees of freedom. The observation is that in many CFTs, we find that this strong coupling to weak coupling ratio for the entropy density is just a simple fraction, three quarters, four fifths, 31, 35th, one half, and so on and so forth. I'm not sure if this is true for all CFTs, but it's certainly true for a large class of CFTs. For QAD3, we, we actually sort of can see really what's happening, okay? It's just that the kinetic term just gets discouraged. So basically the photon only contributes one half of the free theory. So basically what I wanna entertain is the idea that maybe what happened at infinite coupling is that the degrees of freedom are not integer, okay? They are fractions. And that's why we find these funny fractions for all of these uh, strong to weak results because we're comparing theories that have uh, fractional degrees of freedom to theories that have integer degrees of freedom. This is why these fractions sort of come about rather than just funny rational numbers. At first sight, this certainly seems crazy. Um, so basically you would say that, okay, quantum mechanics says it's quantized and they should be quantized in some sort of integers. Um, so you don't, you don't get fractions. But at second sight, it's not so crazy because we do know examples where this actually happens, such as the fractional quantum Hall effect, where also you start with the integer quantum Hall effect, and then you really realize that interactions can actually make these effective fractional degrees of freedom. And you see those in experiment in the quantum Hall effect. So I would claim that maybe this is really what's operating here. Um, field theories at infinite coupling have different degrees of freedom, and these are fractions of the usual degrees of freedom. So I come to my summary. Um, I sort of uh, walked you through many examples of large and field theories, which can be solved exactly, exactly for all couplings. Um, pretty much all of the ones I've talked about are in lower dimensions. I would really say that uh, what I've done here is really just scratching the surface, okay? I've, I've talked almost exclusively about thermodynamics, but really you have full control of your theories. You can do transport, you can calculate transport coefficients, you can do real-time dynamics. There are some that exploit, uh, that does sort of exhibit spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's really sort of a, a, a vastly underexplored field, I would say. I've highlighted some of these results, which are all from 2019, that um, sort of uh, show this uh, strong weak universality. And uh, to me at least, the most mysterious ones of these seem to be this apparent fractionalization of these strong degrees, of, of these degrees of freedom as strong coupling. So I, I, I fully expect that um, there are many more results that can come out of this program of studying um, large and feed theories exactly for all values of the coupling. And I would invite you to also get involved um, already because then I would get at least one non-self citation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. This is all. Okay, thanks. So I have a question. Uh, when, when you uh, mentioned the fractional quantum Hall effect and made an analogy to the fractional quantum Hall effect, are you somehow implying that there are some anionic uh, excitations in these? I, 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 I think what I, I'm not applying quite a bit. I mean, the, the thing that seems interesting to me is that uh, there's a modern understanding of a quantum hall that involves uh, conformity theories um, in the infrared. Right, exactly, yes. And, 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 and what we have here for the theories that I've talked about is exactly that, right? I mean, we have conformity theories in the infrared. Um, hmm. So can it be onions? Maybe. Um, I, 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 I really don't know. Uh, all I can sort of say is that at least for QD3, we really sort of see these um, fractions in operation. So we see that there's this square root appearing um, and that just says that the photon at infinite coupling is just one first one half of what it was in the free theory. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it is a bit of a coincidence that this happens in 3D, right? Because that's exactly where you expect anions to be. And anions don't exist in any other dimension. So. That, that's quite possible. I mean, I, 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 I'm not, no. So all of the theories that I, I uh, sort of showed you solutions for are in three dimensions, but N equals four super angles shows the three quarters in four dimensions. Oh, right, yeah. So, all right. so uh, oh, and, 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 and uh, I also have one example where it's one half in two dimensions. Okay, right. Mm -hmm.
So one perhaps another question uh, is the the name of this uh, seminar series is QFT is a finite T and mu. So have you actually thought about uh, setting a finite chemical potential in this QED case and even maybe going to the limit where the temperature vanishes? Um, so this can be done again. I think that um, if you look at the papers by um, uh, Andreas Ip, uh, Guy Moore, and Tony Repan in the early 2000s, I think they sort of looked at um, finite chemical potential. Um, so yes, operationally, I think it's pretty straightforward to do this. Um, and, and indeed, other people have looked at um, other theories that can be solved exactly in two dimensions, such as the gross nevo model with a chemical potential in large N. Um, yes, so these can be solved. Um, I haven't personally looked at those, um, but I think it's an Another interesting sort of extension. It's just there's only so much I can do in a year. Uh, <laughs> but do you have uh, yeah. intuition whether anything would be qualitatively different in that case? Or do you expect that then, for instance, would you get the same uh, fraction or something like this? So I would expect to get the same fraction, um, but I haven't checked. So, uh, so Paul, I, I, I somehow had to uh, miss the, the, the part I was really interested in, which was about real-time transport. Uh, so can you, can you summarize uh, like very briefly, like what about the dynamic degrees of freedom? Do you have some ex expectations for dynamics? Because as, as far as I heard, you talked about branch cuts. I'm not sure yes. about the yes. dozen branch cuts or, or, or what exactly uh, you said. Yeah. So, so, so yes, uh, this is of course a very interesting story and I, I guess my, my answer will not be very interesting. So um, you, look, you, you, can, you can look at this correlator here um, and of course I could, uh, okay, so there's two parts to the, to the answer. Um, so this particular correlator, the um, scalar channel, if you want so, um, this is particularly nice in these uh, ON models at large N because it turns out that um, there's only this, the one loop contribution that is the leading large N uh, thing. So operationally, all you have to do is solve a, 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 a Feynman integral, which has two propagators, and that's the exact TXY, TXY correlator in the large N limit. Um, if I looked at a channel that, for instance, has a sound pole, um, such as the um, T00, T00 channel, um, it turns out that uh, you have to actually sum up bubbles um, non-perturbatively, which you can do, but it's sort of technically slightly more challenging, and I haven't done it. The other uh, thing that I want to point out is that um, even for this correlator, where this is the exact large end result, the issue is that this result um, is, you, you, you start, this result uh, starts to be, uh, let me put it differently. The hydrodynamic part of this result is the region where the frequency omega is um, smaller than one over n times t. So it's, it's, it's an extremely small frequency such that you need to calculate the one over n correction to get at the hydrodynamic behavior. So it's not the classical large n limit. You have to sort of go to one over n um, to get it out. And uh, I haven't done that. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, do we have more questions from, from the audience? Uh, it would be fantastic. Well, I don't think so. So, in this case, uh, let's thank Paul for this exciting talk. Thank you so much, and sorry for the overtime. Yeah, no problem. It's supposed to be interacting, interactive, uh, and it was. Um, so, one one quick announcement to to close it. We're going to have next talk on December twelfth, which is uh, Thursday, in about one month's time, by Paul Chesler from Harvard. Um, yeah, so we are waiting uh, for your suggestions for who's going to be our speaker in January, February, and so on next year. 
and uh, also if you have ideas uh, what can be done better or what can be done to make it more interactive, uh, please uh, share them uh, with us. So I'm turning off the recording.